Welcome back to the channel. It is Racer X, and today I want to talk a little bit about E85. For quite a while, guys, I have talked about all of the wonderful things E85 does for us. Obviously, I mentioned going E85 on the twin turbo Mustang here pretty soon. When I get that thing installed, the Hellcat is already on E85. Lots of great things about E85, but recently I have come up with a couple of chinks in the armor, and one of which uh, was really completely unexpected, so we are going to cover that today. Also, guys, if you are new to my channel, I need you to do me a gigantic favor. Down there at the bottom, there is a subscribe button. I have all sorts of great things to bring you this year. Also, you can follow me on Instagram, and if you hit that notification bell, you'll know when I have a new video coming out. So here we go. <laughs> we got the 1,000 horsepower helmet. First, I want to tell you a little bit about why I like E85 so well. No, I actually don't have the Hellcat here. Here's the Mustang. Uh, Hellcat is up at uh, Hearst Autoplex right now. But uh, at any rate, um, you know, when I went to E85, I used to run race gas in the Hellcat, and the car was very inconsistent. Um, a lot of it depended on just the DA outside, the humidity. There were all sorts of factors, but the car was very inconsistent. And when I moved to E85, the car all of a sudden became a monster. It was super, super consistent. I knew almost exactly, based on the DA, what that car was going to run, and it would go out and do it time and time again. E85, I know it's not available everywhere, guys, but if you do have it available, um, it's fantastic because it's a nice, clean, cool burning fuel. And uh, there, like I said, there are some drawbacks that I will jump into on E85, but if you want your car to be consistent, I mean, there's a reason that so many uh, you know performance cars, dragsters, all that kind of stuff, that they run ethanol-based fuels. And that's not just E85. You've got like, you know, E90, and there's a bunch of different variants out there. And certainly the E represents the uh, the amount, the, the most amount of ethanol that should be in that fuel. And obviously they backfill with gasoline and depends on, you know, where you get your gasoline and stuff like that. But uh, the E85, ever since I've gone to it, I have been unbelievably pleased. That's why so many people have gone to E85 just because of, of the properties. Basically, you can add more timing with E85 uh, than you can with regular uh, gasoline. And the other thing I want to mention about E85 is uh, the carbon footprint is actually much less than it is with gasoline. Because it burns cleaner, um, the carbon emissions are actually significantly less, which our friends at the EPA, who have been uh, in the news quite a bit, uh, should love. And the other thing is, it is a renewable resource, right? So it's not a fossil fuel. It's grown from corn. And uh, that is a really positive thing, especially considering the way the automotive industry is trending right now. So I'm actually on my way up to the gas station because, well, I want to prove a point. Um, but, you know, I've always said the great thing about E85, and I mentioned the timing aspect of it in terms of, like, you can add more timing to the vehicle, which traditionally puts out more power, and uh, certainly in boosted applications. But it's basically like buying race gas directly from the pump. Now, I do realize that certain um, there are certain quality aspects to the gasoline. There are certain stations that just seem to get higher quality E85 than others. And you have to be pretty aware because really you're going to get anywhere between 51 and 85% ethanol. If your car is tuned for like E70 um, and you get a tank that's like E60, that could uh, cause detonation and just all sorts of problems. So you do have to know where you're getting your fuel from and be careful, but it is great if you find a great fuel station because uh, yeah, let's like, why don't go buy race gas right from the pump and uh, typically it's actually less expensive uh, than regular gasoline, 93 octane. Now I do just wanna to touch on it briefly and I don't wanna get into the science of how uh, ethanol is made, at least not too deep in the weeds, but essentially, yeah, it's made from corn, the same corn that we eat. And believe it or not, it's made basically by the same process that uh, alcohol that people drink is made by. Basically what you've got is uh, you've got starch from the plants. I mean, they grind it up into a powder, but the starch from the plants is fermented. It's distilled into sugars. I've got it all written down here. It's, it gets pretty complicated. Essentially the microbes turn that into uh, ethanol. And uh, there are lots of steps along the way. They add, uh, they add yeast to the sugar mixture. And, uh, and that's kind of what begins the fermentation process. And then that uh, further breaks down the corn mixture into ethanol. And, you know, there's lots of little bitty micro steps in there and they've gotten really good at it. And then at some point later, they add uh, they add gasoline. I will say if you get something like Ignite, they use better quality gasoline that they mix the ethanol with than if you just get normal pump gas. So there is that. But if your car is tuned right and it's on a kind of a safe tune, typically you're okay with pump gas as well. 
Now I wanna get into a couple of the drawbacks that people may not know about E85. And first of all, when you go to uh, to convert your car from a gasoline burning engine to something that's tuned for E85, um, first of all, because E85 um, makes about a third less energy, you need more of it. And because you need more of it, typically you'll need a bigger uh, set of injectors and that costs money. And of course you have the tune piece of it as well. And then on really high horsepower applications, a lot of times you'll need to add things like fuel pumps, bigger fuel lines, uh, there can be sort of a big to do. And so it, it can be a little bit costly to jump over to, uh, to E85. So you have to take that into account. As I mentioned, your miles per gallon will go down. So if you're going to use it for a daily, and you said you get the bigger injectors in the car and all that kind of stuff, you have to expect to burn through more fuel. Now, as I mentioned, the fuel can be a little bit cheaper, um, but you do have to just be aware that you're going to be at the gas pump more often. Another drawback to E85, uh, and I face this problem uh, with the Hellcat, is that I don't drive that car all the time, and especially if you have inclement weather or whatever going on. I mean, sometimes that car will sit for a couple of weeks. Well, when uh, when E85 sits, it tends to uh, to separate, and you kind of get like a water layer in there, and you don't want that water layer essentially getting into your engine. It can cause all sorts of different problems. So uh, really, with E85, the key is to just drive the thing. Don't let it sit for extended periods of time and actually let that fuel separate uh, because it can be a problem for your engine. Now, as I mentioned before, one of the great things about E85 is it it's not a fossil fuel. It is a renewable resource. But as I kind of dug into this just a little bit more, um, I found out something kind of interesting. Um, it actually takes quite a bit of land to make E85. And keep in mind, we're, we're pulling from the same resource that people, uh, you know, people eat, right? I mean, people need food. And basically, you're pulling away from that resource to make fuel. So you got to keep that in mind. And uh, one of the staggering things I found out is basically one acre of corn that's used to make E85 will basically yield 328 gallons of E85. And while 328 gallons might seem like a lot, an acre is a pretty big space. And um, 328 gallons seems like something my Hellcat could go through in a week. I mean, not, not really, but that basically makes my Hellcat like some sort of a industrial wood chipper for, uh, for the environment. So it is kind of a staggering fact when you think about using more fuel and uh, just how much corn it takes to make that fuel. And really the last drawback to E85 and something that really never even came into my mind um, was what if something happens to the, uh, to the crop yield on the corn? Well, uh, we actually had a really nasty storm here in Texas, maybe, I don't know, less than a month ago, where uh, it got really cold here. Matter of fact, it was one of the coldest days ever recorded here at like four degrees. And I know you guys up there in Wisconsin or Canada are like, oh, that's like, <laughs> that's swimsuit weather. But down here in Texas, that does not happen. And a lot of the corn was killed off. And so to kind of illustrate what happens uh, there, let's drive through this gas station. Now, this is actually the fourth station that I have been to and if you look carefully, there are bags over every one of these yellow E85 handles. That is a problem because they simply do not have it. So this is my normal filling station. This is a Murphy. Um, they typically get very good quality E85, which is part of the reason that I went to E85 on my Hellcat. This station is five minutes from my house. It's very convenient. And uh, as you can see right back here, there are bags on the handle. And like I said, three and a half weeks or so, this station has been out of E85. And I have been to multiple stations trying to find E85 and I literally cannot find it. So somebody may message me, it's all race Rex. This station has it 40 miles from you or whatever else. And keep in mind, it takes me a lot of fuel just to get up there to fill it up so the gas tank's half empty when I get home anyway. Um, but what it's basically happened is it has turned my Hellcat into a 4,500 pound paperweight. And my biggest fear is that when I go twin turbo on this, if you haven't seen my recent video, uh, yes, I have a Bad Daddy 64 millimeter twin turbo kit going on this and the car will be much happier on E85. But this is my daily. And uh, if I'm having to deal with this, how am I gonna drive this car as a daily if I can't get fuel for it? This could be a problem. Now, I know some of you are gonna mention this in the comments, but they do actually have uh, flex fuel tunes out there for a lot of vehicles. And that kind of eliminates some of that problem, right? I mean, you can either run E85 
or you can run regular gasoline. So you kind of get the best of both worlds when you do that. But I will say they do run into some tuning issues when it comes to, uh, to flex fuel and uh, for a dedicated race type vehicle, um, it can also be a little bit problematic because sometimes the sensors don't necessarily act right. And so there are a couple of little drawbacks to some of the flex fuel tuning out there. And in some instances it actually works quite well. But if you can get tuned for flex fuel where you can run both 93 octane or E85, it's a pretty good way to go. So yeah, I've mentioned it in the past. I felt like E85 might be just the magic bullet to everything happening and with the EPA because it does burn colder and cleaner. Um, and there's a lot of positive things to E85. You have to take really everything into account. Who can account for like a big storm that comes through and knocks out a bunch of crops? But there are environmental factors uh, that are at play here. And as I mentioned, E85 does take a lot of land. And so we still have to get people fed out there. And so uh, you really have to factor those things in. So maybe E85 is not necessarily the magic bullet that I thought it was. I still love it as a fuel. It's fantastic, but um, not without its issues. So anyway, guys, let me know what you think about that in the comments down below. That's it for this one. I will catch you on the next one. So until then, RacerX.